Hi guys, it's Asia, and it's been a while, so yeah, I don't know. Anyway, today I decided I want to do something a little different, something that I'm actually more interested in. I don't know, in my spare time I like to research different people and events and things I find to be interesting, so I figured why not just record myself reading the information I found. And one of the things I found to be interesting is the fact that a lot of people I know don't know about the Tulsa race massacre. I don't know, people call it the race riot, but really it wasn't a riot because it was kind of one-sided, so it was a massacre. Anyway, the Tulsa massacre. Um, even people I went to school with didn't know about it. I myself didn't know about it until after I graduated high school and just one day I happened to come upon it somehow. I don't remember if it just like popped up on Google or something one day and I just started researching it. But anyway, I decided that I wanted to make a video about it because it's just really weird to me. Not weird, I guess, because I mean, the whole idea, the whole point was that it would be hidden. So of course a lot of people would know about it. It's not in textbooks or anything like that. So obviously a lot of people wouldn't know about it, which was the goal. But um, yeah, it's like, it's the 99th anniversary now so I think it's really interesting and I think a lot more people should know about it so I want to make a video about it because I found it to be interesting and I actually found out a lot more information now than I did before when I researched it and anyway I just want to make a video about it and I want to do it while I put on my makeup because I like makeup I like random research material I don't know I like <laughs> finding out information about random events and people and things I find to be interesting. So I'm going to combine the two and just do it like that. So yeah, I'm going to do that today. And I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learn something. And also what I found is not just about the massacre. It's about important people from that time and who really helped shape, shape Greenwood and turn it into what it became before the massacre. And like why and what happened. This is gonna be different for me. I don't usually talk while I put my makeup on. So I'm not quite sure how to do this, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to do it. We'll see. And I'll just put like the description of all of the makeup and stuff I use in the box below instead of trying to explain them both at the same time because that can be confusing. Alright, so the Tulsa Race Massacre, it started May 31st, 1921 and ended June 1st, 1921. So it lasted two days. I was getting kind of mad doing the research on this to be honest with you. Just because not much has changed. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood uh, district was the black owned district. It was Black Wall Street as a lot of people like to call it. It was thriving, it was amazing, there were a lot of black professionals there, doctors, lawyers, they had their own businesses, their own buildings, and during that time it was segregated of course, so that was the all black area. And it was the most, one of the most prosperous African American districts in the U.S. at that time. And Greenwood was also a booming oil district as well. It was a booming oil town. Greenwood was founded in 1906 on Native American territory. Sorry, I'm reading my notes as well because there's no way I can remember all this, especially the dates and stuff. Like I've always had issues with remembering exact dates and everything when it comes to history. I don't see how people do that. Like how do you remember exact dates? <sighs> okay, Green was found in 1906 on Native American territory and the Native Americans were forced to relocate during that time. 
and this was something I didn't know. I didn't know Native Americans had uh, black slaves. So their slaves inherited the land after they were forced to relocate. Well, when the tribes were forced to relocate, uh, their former slaves acquired their land through the Dawes Act. The U.S. law that gave land to the individual Native Americans and many of the black sharecroppers fled there as well after the Civil War. Looking for a better life, of course. At the time when African Americans were fleeing to Oklahoma looking for a better life after the Civil War, Oklahoma was being promoted as a safe haven for black people. They only knew. This looks so red. Show must go on, I guess. Anyway. Yeah, Oklahoma was being promoted as a safe haven for black people. A safe haven for black people. And they founded more than 50 black townships in the state between 1865 and 1920. It was the largest number of black townships after the Civil War. And someone named O.W. Gurley was a wealthy black landowner who purchased 40 acres of land in Tulsa. He named it Greenwood after the town in Mississippi. I couldn't find out why he named it after a town in Mississippi. I don't know the significance to that. But that's what he did, and he was a businessman and a real estate de real estate developer. And he sold his land in Perry to move to Tulsa with his wife and daughter because he heard how, how, how prosperous it was and how great it was doing there. And like I said, it was promoted as a safe haven for black people. So he was like, why not? So he went there with his family, started several businesses. Uh, he started a hotel which was like the biggest black owned hotel at the time he started that in greenwood and the land in tulsa that he purchased was only allowed to be sold to black people based on the first law passed in the state of oklahoma 33 days after statehood and of course jim crow was set into place requiring that black and white people live separately I want this to be yes, less red and this is fucking red. So Gurley was said to have the first uh, black businesses in Greenwood. In 1906. He wanted to create something for black people, by black people, FUBU, for black people, by the, yeah, FUBU. So the original FUBU. Um, his first business was a boarding room, a boarding room house, a boarding house. Uh, and it became super popular among black people, of course, because they were the only ones allowed to live in that area due to segregation. They were literally cut off from the white town by a train, uh, by train tracks. So they were on the other side of town, of course. Other side of the train tracks, is that how the saying goes? They were literally separated like that. And his boarding room house, his boarding house became really popular among people fleeing from oppression, especially from Mississippi. So maybe that's why he named it Greenwood after the place in Mississippi, because Mississippi was super racist. 
like that's weird because every place was super racist but I guess Mississippi was the worst at the time I don't know but specifically mentioned that people from Mississippi fled there from um, to escape oppression and he also provided monetary loans to people black people looking to start businesses in Greenwood to like help build up the community which I thought was incredible So he had his hands in a lot of things in Greenwood and just seemed like he was overall just trying to do really, really great things. Yeah, the hotel he built was a 55 room luxury hotel. It bared his name. And it was the largest hotel, black owned hotel in the country at the time. And he believed like that black people could do great things if they just pulled their resources together, which clearly that's what they were doing in Greenwood and it worked. So he was not wrong. Like black people could do amazing things if we just all just work together. Well, girly pref um Gurley then started a partnership with another man named J.B. Stratford and he was another black entrepreneur and they made a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, Stratford made $150,000 at the time which was which equated to about $3 million in 2018. Um, and Gurley owned more than a hundred properties in Greenwood and had an estimated net worth of 500000 to one hundred to one million, which was about 6.8 to $13.6 million in 2018. Yeah, it's hard to do my eyebrows and talk at the same time, but okay. And Gurley was also appointed sheriff's deputy by Tulsa at that time as well which kind of made people start looking at him a little weird like the people of Greenwood because they were like why would you want to work with the oppressors essentially which I mean I get it. that's kind of weird like yeah why would you want but I could see it also like looking from the inside out to help your people, but at the same time, yeah, don't trust their oppressors. So I can see why they were looking at him kind of weird. Like, giving a side eye, like, bro. Especially if he was a businessman, like, why would you want to be a sheriff's deputy? Like, you're so much better than that. But, in the end, it really didn't matter. Like, his position, his money, his buildings, none of that mattered during the riots and the massacre. It didn't protect him. It didn't save him from anything. He lost, He said to lost about $200,000 throughout all of that because he lost all of his buildings. His pool uh, parlor, his billiard parlor, that's what they call it, his boarding house, his hotel, his home, all of it. Luckily, he and his family survived, but... They lost everything pretty much. So again, I don't understand why he wanted to be a sheriff's deputy or was appointed sheriff's deputy, but okay. Also in Tulsa, sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but also in Tulsa, I'm just trying to say like the backstory of like some of the places in Greenwood that were prominent in helping the people of Greenwood kind of trying to give you a backstory of Greenwood like what it was like there and they had their own newspaper it's called the Tulsa Star it was founded by AJ Smitherman 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 AJ Smitherman who's and it was a black newspaper of course um, it was stationed in Greenwood it was regularly informed this newspaper was great 
Like, we really need one now. It regularly informed African Americans about their rights, and um, their legal rights, uh, any court rulings or leg legis legislations that were beneficial or harmful to their community as well. So, it kind of kept the people informed about their rights, like, they probably didn't know that they had, and... pretty much help them keep up to date with that so they weren't like screwed over in the courtrooms and whatnot or if they were pulled over by police they knew their rights and they just weren't like ignorant to it and just like taking advantage of it basically even though they probably still did that anyway because they didn't care about the <sighs> the laws didn't seem to matter then similar to now anyway Oklahoma seemed to become increasingly racist after statehood. So Greenwood was somewhat of a safe haven for black people. Um, somewhat. It was still, like, the white neighborhood was still right there, just past the train tracks. And they were separated by that train track. But in Greenwood, they had luxury shops, they had restaurants, they had school, they had doctor's offices, dentists, uh, libraries, post office. News, uh, newspaper, nightclubs, you name it. They, taxi services, bus services, all of that. And, of course, not everybody there was a business owner. Some people still, like, work jobs as janitors and whatnot. And some people worked on the other side of town in the white area. But they would come to Greenwood to spend their money. And it said that the the dollar exchange hands in Greenwood about 19 times before it left the community, which is great. Like, that's how you keep the money in the community, among the people, to help your people. You spend money amongst each other and their businesses, and you, that's how you help people out, you know what I mean? Like, that's how you build the businesses, and they become profitable, and they become, like, freaking, um, Jeff Bezos or something. They, that's how you do it. So, so of course, of course, of course, Greenwood was be just becoming bigger and better and just more amazing, more businesses, more people, more black people, and the white area didn't like that. Across the tracks, they didn't like that. They were like, black people shouldn't be this wealthy, they shouldn't be better than what they perceived as better than the white people over there. So they weren't happy about that. Like they were pissed off from day one, basically anyway. So they were looking for any reason. They were looking for any reason to start something, to be honest, like let's be honest. They were looking for anything. And if you're looking for something, you're gonna find it. So yeah, like them building up and becoming bigger and better and stuff, the white people across the tracks, they started to notice that. Um, they started to notice their wealthy lifestyles, their restaurants, their jewelry, all that stuff. And they were like, hey, black people are supposed to be the inferior race. They shouldn't have all these luxury items, all these luxury buildings and stuff like that. They shouldn't have these hotels. They shouldn't be able to afford anything. So... A lot of people felt like jealousy played a large role in what happened, which, I mean, honestly, you can't, there's no way it didn't. I can't find what I'm looking for. So yeah, during this time, it was also the resurgence of the KKK, of course. And that had black people in Greenwood nervous. Um, yeah. There, <clears throat> their lives and their livelihoods were continuously threatened and there was a huge rise in lynchings during this time as well. So of course they were nervous, they were scared, unsure of their futures, but they just kept going on. Tulsa Star. The Tulsa Star encouraged black people to bear arms. I freaking love the Tulsa Star. Like, they're amazing. 
in someone needs to start another black owned newspaper like this to constantly remind people and people of color of their rights because I'm sick of what's happening today honestly um and to just constantly keep people informed But yeah, the Tulsa Star encouraged black people to bear arms and to show up at courthouses and jails when a black person was arrested to prevent lynchings by the white mobs and the KKK, of course, because that's something that would happen quite often. So for, to prevent that from happening, they would... have other black people go there or encourage other black people to go there with their own guns to make sure they made it in there safely and they made it to the court hearing safely. And without harm done to them. Which is wild to me. It's like, okay, aren't these cops supposed to stop things like this from happening? Like Mobs of people aren't supposed to just be able to take innocent people or people who are going to trial or whatever and just take them away and murder them. That's, I mean, they're not supposed to be able to do that, but here we are and there we were. Alright, so let's get to the actual day. That was a little bit of a backstory. Let's get to the actual day and, uh, in history where this all began. 1921, May 31st. So it is said that during a, the height of racial animosity, a kid, a 19 year old boy named Dick, Dick Rowland, he was riding the elevator um, in a hotel, what hotel was it? In the Drexel Building Hotel. In the Drexel Building Hotel and he was just trying to get to a restroom he had to pee so he was trying to get to a restroom anyway as he was getting off of the elevator he accidentally um, or while he was on the elevator he accidentally tripped and fell and as he was trying to catch his balance he just reached out and, and grabbed onto the closest thing to him which just happened to be the elevator operator which was a 16 year old girl named Sarah Page yeah 16 year old girl named Sarah Page and it said that she shrieked out in, uh, yeah, she just screamed due to being startled. Um, not like she was being attacked, but she screamed because she was startled, like, oh, you, you touch me. <laughs> but, yeah, so that happened, and the guy, he ran off because he was scared. Dick Rowland, he was scared. I mean, it was 1920s, of course he was scared. Like, he, they were lynching black people left and right for no reason. So of course he ran off and the KKK was being praised as heroes. So yeah, he ran off because he was scared. Because of course this white girl screamed, everybody saw, everybody looked around, people started murmuring, yelling and stuff, so he ran off. And it said he ran to Greenwood um, where his mom lived. And as he was leaving, the cop showed up and another store clerk said that, claimed that Dick attempted to sexually assault Sarah. So it wasn't even Sarah that said it. It was another store clerk, a white store clerk, a guy that said, oh, he attempted to sexually assault her on the elevator. Which didn't even make any sense. Like, why would he attempt to sexually assault her on the elevator knowing he would get caught once he got off or whatever? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. But anyway, that's what's said to have happened. And the next day, Dick was brought in to uh, be charged. Uh, I don't know if he was turn if he came in on his own. I believe he came in on his own, um, but it just said that he was brought in to be charged. Yeah, it, he um, was arrested the next day, and the Tulsa tri Tribune. I'm not good at talking. The Tulsa Tribune Tribune ran an article saying, uh, on the front page, the headline read. 
Nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator. Cool. And it claimed it claimed that Dick had attacked Paige, Paige in the elevator and ran off. And cue the local white mob that showed up to the uh, courthouse um, to try and kill him. So then, of course, uh, black people show up at the courthouse as well with their own guns to save him so that he wouldn't be hurt. And it's not said what happened exactly, like who let out the first shot, but apparently a shot was fired and and then other people started firing and there ended up being 12 people murdered at the courthouse that day amongst the two groups of people, the white mob and the black people trying to their poor dick to save him or hurt him. And among the two mobs, 12 people were killed, uh, 10 white people, two black people. And this started everything in Greenwood. So after this, black people went back to Greenwood. Um, they told everybody what happened. Everybody started getting ready because they knew it was going to happen next because this is what this is what they wanted. Honestly, um, white people, that's what they wanted. They wanted a reason to go in Greenwood and burn it down. Basically, that's what they wanted. And of course, they're not going to let you get away with killing 10 white people. They're not going to let that happen. So yeah, this started the massacre that lasted more than 16 hours. Uh, mobs of white people came into Greenwood armed and ready to go. They, um, let me do this. I'm not even doing anything. They... Of course, they looted everything before they burned it to the ground. They looted homes, businesses, everything they could before burning it to the ground. They murdered whoever they could. Um, a lot of black people were also taken into custody and held there for more than eight hours. Even though they didn't do anything, they were just they were still taken into custody and just thrown there for more than eight hours. No food, no water. It was just crazy. Some people, some people fled to the woods because they didn't know where else to go so yeah um people just tried to get out and save themselves save their families so yeah fires were started shots were fired and it's also said that airplanes were above um dropping bombs on buildings Supposedly, this is also the first time that the U.S. bombed its own land, its own people. It, it was just horrific. It was, uh, apparently, also, a 10-page manuscript was found recently. Um, I would say that within the last few years. A 10-page manuscript was found. It was written by a lawyer who was actually there. Um, first-hand account. It was found folded into three sections. But anyway, in this manuscript, the author of the manuscript, Buck Colbert Franklin, who was born in 1979, died in 19, was born 1879, and died in 1960, he was a lawyer who lived in Greenwood and who had a business in Greenwood and he wrote that he could see the planes above I'm gonna read this he said he wrote I could see the planes circling in midair they threw in number I'm sorry they wrote I could see planes circling in midair they grew in number and hummed darted and dipped low I could hear something like hail falling upon the top of my office building down East Archer. I saw the old Midway Hotel on fire, burning from its top, and then another, and then another, and another building began to burn from their tops. So yeah, they were throwing bombs outside of the planes. Um, and a lot of other articles try to claim that they were used trying to throw out water out of the planes to try to put out the fires which was obviously a lie yeah if these buildings are burning from their tops you're throwing fire bombs out there so then 
He also wrote Lurid flames roared and belched and lights Oh, sorry. Lurid flames roared and belched and licked their forked tongue, tongues into the air. Smoke ascended the sky in thick black volumes and amid it all the planes, now a dozen or more in number, still hummed and darted here and there with the agility of natural birds of the air. I couldn't even imagine being in that situation. That's just terrifying. Like, and no one was there to help. Like, they. He also wrote like they wonder like where, where was the fire department, or someone to help the police or anybody, and no one was there because the mob, the white mob, was keeping everyone from helping. They wouldn't even let the Red Cross in. Like the Red Cross was on the outskirts trying to help, but they wouldn't let them in to help. Like, they threatened them, too, said they would kill them as well if they tried to help. So, yeah. It's just terrible. So, yeah, Franklin said he left his office and he tried to find a safe way out. He said that the sidewalks were literally covered in burning turpentine balls. So... And his full 10-page manuscript is now in the Smithsonian, in the Smithsonian, the National Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So I wonder if they like have it printed where you could take it or read it or read all of it because I would love to read all of it because he, I read, there was more to it in the article that I read and he really went into detail about what he saw and um, honestly if it was if you went through something like that horrific like you would I'm sure you remember like every little detail as well like that's crazy I couldn't imagine living in that time like being afraid the KKK or any white person could just say or do anything to you basically and just murder you like and it's sad because like not much has changed not a whole lot has changed but yeah I just feel I don't know it was just a lot to read. Like, I wanted to do this a while ago, but it took me a while to finish writing my notes. It's also said that for years, years, black women would walk around uh, Tulsa and they would see white women wearing their, their jewelry and they would snatch it off of them because they stole it during the riots or looting or their hub husbands or whoever stole it from them doing the riots and looting and stuff and also doing the riots and stuff well doing during the massacre random white people were deputized and given guns and just basically let loose they were like no rules whatever do what you want to do kill, kill whoever you want to kill it was yeah they were they're like balls to the wall do whatever you want to do that's what happened and basically they didn't stop until Greenwood was decimated and then also during this time a lot of people were wondering like where the fire department and the police department was and I told you like they were threatened by the white people as well but then also the government was complicit with the mob so they were just like they were on their side they were like you're not going to help these people basically and it was mob rule for two days straight and then yeah, mob roof for two days straight, so more than 35 blocks were burned to the ground, 1,200 houses, uh, and 300, more than 300 people died. Mostly black people, of course. And the governor, the National Guard was called after the governor declared martial law. I don't even know what I'm doing, honestly. I just wanted to use this palette, I guess. And after the National Guard was called in, more than 6,000 black people were imprisoned. Everyone who wasn't in prison already was imprisoned. So more than 6,000 black people were imprisoned for more than 8 hours. For no reason.
Whoops. And this was really interesting too. One thing I read is that one survivor stated the formulated formulated uh stereotype of black about black men raping white women and accused of raping white women and how that was used and it was used with great success from slavery from the end of slavery to the early to the 20th century and going i had the end going because it is end going so then this is really sad i read that after the massacre um a lot of items were sold from the massacre um stolen stolen items of course from the massacre were sold And then people were also selling postcards. White people were selling postcards and trading postcards with pictures of corpses from the massacre. They were like selling them and trading them like trading cards to each other. And they said this is this was a way to assert assert their white superiority. It's like so disgusting and weird and it's just like what the fuck <sighs> so weird so disgusting it's just like like are you really that pathetic like i don't know they were called riot postcards and they were sold to assert their right their to sell their white supremacy and like i said in the beginnings of this um this isn't mentioned in history textbooks or anything like that um i'm not sure if they're going to add it now because a lot more people know about it now i mean like i said we're we're past now the 99th anniversary um the 99th anniversary would have been in may and june 1st so we're past it now um and a lot a lot more people know about it now because it was just like all over the internet when it was coming up. Uh, I read about it before then, and I, that's why I didn't realize that so many people didn't know about it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I remember growing up and I would try to talk to some of my friends about it, like back when I was a teenager, and they had no idea what I was talking about. And it kind of blew my mind, like how, did you, how do you not know that, about this? But also, it said that the U.S. tried to hide this. That was their goal, was to hide that this ever happened. But thankfully, um, thankfully to the survivors, this wasn't hidden or forgotten about. Like, people knew about it. So they weren't able to hide it like they were trying to do. They kept it out of textbooks, but thanks to the internet, they can't do that anymore. Or they can keep it out of textbooks, but they can't keep the information. And like I said also, there have been a lot of recovered items that are now at the Smithsonian. Aside from the manuscript, there's also other recovered items from victims of that massacre at the Smithsonian as well. But, despite the devastation, um, it was, the black community was able to rebuild somewhat. Of course, it wasn't like it was before, but also I read that Oklahoma bought back a lot of the land there as well, so it wasn't as big as it was before either, which was probably one of their main goals as well, was to take back the land and all that stuff, which is weird because it's like, wasn't that land supposed to be for black people and they were using it like they were supposed to and so i'm like well the only issue was that the white people felt inferior then so then they were like no we're gonna take it back because you're not supposed to have more than or better things than we have which is so bizarre it's so weird and so pathetic And also one of the reasons why a lot of people are talking about this now is because allegedly there is a mass grave that has been discovered in one of the cemeteries. 
Because, I mean, of course, they didn't go around and individually bury everyone. Because they were taking pictures with the corpses and of the corpses. And also, they didn't care. So, allegedly, a lot of these people were just thrown in mass graves in a cemetery. But, thanks to archaeologists, thanks to archaeologists and forensic anthropologists, and their, their ground penetrating radar machine, this mass grave was discovered or suspected of being a mass grave. They haven't found it yet. They found it, they know where it is, but they haven't dug into it yet from what I read. They're um, going to start excavation soon. They say they're going to be super respectful of the graves that are already there. They're going to be super respectful of the graves that are already there. Um, they're going to use a machine to dig very shallow, like a very shallow hole, and then they're going to dig the rest by hand as to not disturb any remains that may be there. So that's great. <sighs> but yeah, um, thanks to the radar machine, a large anomaly was found in the cemetery, which made them believe that that is a mass grave because I mean 300 people aren't just going to go missing and that's what they were trying to say happened like no graves nothing 300 people just went missing but anyway yeah so green was burned to the ground completely decimated it was just insane um and the kid in the beginning kid in the beginning dick rolling he actually left town after that. Like, he, throughout all this, he was in jail. So, he wasn't even part of all this. But throughout all this, he was in jail. And then after everything was said and done, he left town. Because Paige dropped the charges. She didn't want to press charges. She was like, no. So, after all that was said and done, he left town. Um, and also the guy I told you about in the beginning as well... So yeah, the guy I told you about in the beginning as well, Gurley, who had like over a hundred properties in Greenwood, he actually made it out as well. He and his family made it out reportedly. Um, some people speculated at first that he was murdered during the massacre, um, but then also there was reports of he and his family actually making it to California after all this, and he actually started another little smaller hotel in California. So, I hope the latter is true and they actually made it out and they were okay. That's just wild though, like for real. When a lot of people say, oh, um, people only want handouts and they need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and do this and do that. And I'm like, well, people in Greenwood did exactly that. Like a lot of these people from Greenwood who moved to Greenwood, they were former slaves or born into slavery and they were released and moved to Greenwood, started their own businesses and all that stuff just to be murdered due to racism. It's like, you can't say you need to pull yourself up when, when someone does that, they're just murdered because they did exactly that. And white people were jealous because they did that. It's like that made no as that it made it made no sense. And I guess that was the point, honestly. Like it wasn't supposed to make sense. They just exist. They didn't want us to exist. Like it was a lot, honestly. Um I came across a few other videos of people talking about this and like I said, it's a lot of information, so I just wanted to add some more information to what was already spoken about in other videos by other people. Because, like I said, I think it's very interesting, and I think a lot more people should know about it. And I personally know a lot of people who did not know about it. Until recently. Hopefully they... Like... 
did their own research and learned more about it throughout the years, I hope. But if not, now here's this video. And also, I also implore you to do more research on your own because I did leave some stuff out just because I didn't want the video to be super long. And like I said, I got seven and a half pages of notes. And I honestly could have kept going just by the different names and are starting to get into everybody's backstory and there is so much more to it. Um, so I would implore you to go ahead and do your own research as well if you want to know more about it and more about the people there and the survivors and stuff like that. Because honestly there could be like a whole nother video just about the survivors and stuff. But yeah, the people of Greenville were absolutely admirable, like, they were incredible. Like, they came from nothing, they started their own businesses, they did all this stuff, they kept their money in in the community and helped each other out. Like, it's... I would love to see another community like that today, honestly. Yeah, I would love to see that happen again today. The people of the, the black community just thriving and just being amazing <laughs> having their own school system their own buses and their own taxi companies and it's just it sounded incredible like for real restaurants and all that stuff but yeah I mean it took me a while because I didn't feel right about coming back and doing videos just about makeup with everything that's going on like all the murdering going on the police murders and all this stuff just happening and just like it didn't feel right to come back and just be like oh hey makeup like no let's learn some stuff so i think i'm gonna do this from now on i liked it um i know it was kind of like all over the place because it was kind of new but i'm gonna try to i'm gonna get better at it i'm gonna get better at it first of all i'm gonna get better at it and try to write exactly what I want to say. I don't know. I had seven and a half pages of notes. Um, I'm trying to con condense it down a little better. But yeah, I do implore you to seriously go and research it some more on your own and find out more information because it is a lot and it is very, very interesting and very sad, really. It, it really made me sad. <laughs> seriously. Like reading all of it, it made me so sad. Um, and I wasn't sure and I just had to talk myself into doing the video. It's like, go ahead and just do the video because it needs to be done. So I did it. I'm glad I did it. And also as a way, because I'm trying to figure out how to teach my daughter about black history without being like, without traumatizing her because she's eight. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out how to exactly go about it and make it like, not kid friendly, but just not traumatizing. <laughs> so I'm trying to work on that as well. Um, but anyway, I wanted to do this video, I finally did it, I'm glad I did it, and I think I'm going to do more videos like this just because I think they're interesting and I like information, I like learning things, and I like telling people about the things I've learned. And like I said, I just do research on random things that I enjoy or that I find interesting, so I think I'm going to do that from now on and just share it with everybody anyway i hope you enjoyed thanks for watching please don't forget to subscribe if you want to subscribe and please like this video if you like this video uh leave a comment down below tell me whatever you know about this situation as well um, i'm sure i missed some stuff there was so much to read it was a lot it was a lot so many different articles and encounters um but yeah let me know what you know and that would be really cool <laughs> anyway thanks and I'll see you next time. Bye.